Good morning again, friends. I would ask how you're doing, but that is so 2019. As this year has progressed, we've come up with much more relevant ways of checking in with each other, haven't we? For example, in March and April, we were asking, how is your how's your quarantine going? In May, we may, or I guess I was also April, we may have been inquiring politely into our New York friends' COVID status. I know I was reaching out to my friends in New York and finding out what their COVID status was. In June, July, and August, we may have been fending off well-meaning inquiries from our families and friends around the country about how we were surviving the protests in a city that everyone thought was burning down around us. How ironic, for now the world really is burning down around us, and our latest wellness check seems to be into uh, one another's air quality numbers. Are you up to 500 yet? I'm at 350 and praying for rain. Three days ago, I didn't even know what these numbers meant. And now I have one app and two websites open on my phone, tracking my air quality numbers in real time. And all I can say is enough already. I am so done with 2020. I wish I could just eat a magic jelly bean that would put me to sleep until it's all over. <clears throat> I don't think anyone could possibly have imagined how truly awful this final year in the second decade of the 21st century would be. But here we are. And we've learned better than to say it can't get any worse because it can always get worse, can't it? When the ancient Hebrews were in exile they wrote Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Sometimes all you can do is sit down and weep. And so today, metaphorically speaking, or maybe literally, some of us can sit down together and we can take a moment, a moment to weep to experience or allow ourselves to feel our grief, to lament, to grieve the lives lost. The COVID-19, 194,000 lives and counting. That is 64 9-11s, 64. And yet we haven't yet seemed to find a way to come together as a nation to acknowledge and mourn together the loss of these lives. We grieve also the lives snuffed out by the police and by vigilantes that hunt black people. We have learned to say their names. Trayvon Martin, Philando Castile, Tamir Rice, Eric Garner, Ahmaud Arbery, Rihanna Taylor, George Floyd, and so many more. We grieve also the loss of life in the recent protests on both sides. Anthony Huber, Joseph Rosenbaum, and Aaron J. Danielson. And it's not only the loss of our dead, it's the trauma to the living. We have seen our young people, moms and dads, clergy and veterans being gassed 
by the police and the feds, by our own government. Could we have imagined it? We've seen angry young men patrolling our streets, our streets, in trucks, clashing violently on the streets with Antifa protesters. We fear for what lies ahead in an election season like no other that we have known. Many of us have known sleepless nights and anxiety-filled days. We have lived with uncertainty of what each next day will bring and when and whether our children can go back to school or when and whether our jobs will survive or come back. And we have perhaps most recently learned to pack an emergency away bag and put it by the door in case we too have to evacuate. Well, now we grieve also for those tragically lost to the fires in Oregon and California throughout the West whose names are still coming in. Later in the service, we'll have an opportunity to pause and really drop down into a time of prayer for those and for all whom we have lost, for the pain for our families, our state, our nation, and our world, for healing from the distress and trauma we have experienced in recent months. I would like to invite you all to stop and take some deep breaths. But who wants to breathe this air? What do we do when the very air we breathe turns against life? Maybe we do just sit down and weep. And then maybe we can ask whether there is anything our faith has to offer us in times like these. Anything that's not pulp fiction, pulp religion, pie in the sky promises that if we just turn our lives over to Jesus and pray harder, God will answer all our prayers. Anything that's not false promises, that if we just pray right, God will protect us from the virus, whether or not we wear a mask or from the fires whether or not we ever address human-caused climate change. But that's not how God works. You'd think we would have uh, figured that out by now. But if that's not how God works, that seems to leave us with only two options. Kick God to the curb and actively disbelieve in God as many understandably do, or work to figure out how God works in our world, or put another way, how the gift of our faith might work within us and for us to sustain us, no matter what challenges life throws our way. So that with the Apostle Paul, we might be able to say, I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through the one who strengthens me. This is the same Paul, of course, who taught us in the Romans text we read for today, to trace a line to connect the dots between our suffering or our troubles, as Eugene Peterson's The Message Version of the Bible puts it, to connect our troubles to the surprising gifts of faith that are available for those who know God. Gifts of passionate patience or endurance, 
gives a strong character like tempered steel and the gift of hope false hope or superficial hope but the alert expectancy that god is up to something good even in the worst of times that there is an active conspiracy of goodness underway in the universe that we are invited to participate in but how do we get from our felt experience of grief and pain and just plain old anxiety to those final exuberant lines of our Romans text this morning in alert expectancy such as this we're never left feeling shortchanged quite the contrary we can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit well, to say it's a mystery how to get from the suffering to that exuberant praise is as unsatisfying as it is true. It is a mystery. Whenever we see people who seem to just move through or come out of, of times of suffering with their, their spirits intact, you know, the ones, the people who can express gratitude even through their tears when they're standing in the ashes of their burned out homes. And they can do that because their family, their family made it out alive. And in that moment, they know that that's what really matters. The people that show up at the volunteer centers to help the evacuees or the homeless animals with a smile on their faces, or the volunteer firefighters and medics who run toward the fire instead of away from it. Even the fire chief, I can't remember where this is, but it was someplace down in Southern Oregon. The fire chief died fighting a fire. We know people who manage to maintain resilience in their hearts, even in spite of great suffering. And I don't mean to trivialize the suffering that these folks experience because they, they feel the pain and often have PTSD to contend with after the crisis is over. But we've all known pe people who somehow seem to draw on inner resources of faith that can carry them through truly awful times and make them resilient in the face of crisis after crisis. I bet you could name some of these people. These are the resources of faith known to the great mystics, but they're available to all of us. Because access to the power and the love of God that can sustain us through hardship is actually our birthright. That power and love of God has been implanted in us and we can learn how to touch into it and release it into our lives and into our world. Well, how? How do we learn to do this? Richard Rohr, a, a modern mystic for our times, has spent his life honing one particular great insight, as far as I can tell, that he keeps finding new ways to share with folks. And that's the insight that Tom read for you in our modern testimony for today. It is the revelation, and I do think it, it's a revelation, it's a gift, that there are really only two paths to spiritual transformation, two paths to that experience or capacity for resilience and even moments of true joy in the midst of our hardship and suffering. And those paths are the path of great love and the path of great suffering. As Rohr explains to us, 
These paths level the playing field of all the world's religions for only love and suffering are strong enough to break down our usual ego defenses, crush our dualistic thinking and open us to mystery. In my experience, he says, they like nothing else can transmute us from a fear-based life to a love-based life. Roar talks a lot about the secret that comes when our hearts are broken up open, either by an experience of great love or an experience of great suffering. The secret that we gain into an understanding that our, our lives and our hearts and our, our spirits are not secured by anything us, not by the stability of external circumstances or the uh, reassurance of our 401ks or the, uh, the upward path of our career ladder with promotion expected after promotion until we achieve our dreams. Roar knows that ultimately those false hopes will fail us because the world will disappoint us. We will fail or someone will betray us and we will fall back down again. He talks about this a lot in his book, Falling Upwards, a spirituality for the two halves of life, which I highly recommend to you. If you haven't read it. This paradox of falling upwards is the insight that it is often through our failures rather than our successes that we mature as human beings and that we grow in our faith. And I think that this is at the very heart of the Christian message, even in that symbol of our faith that many of us understandably struggle with in modern times, and that is the symbol of the cross. The kerygma, the core, uh, message at the heart of the Christian gospel that through death comes life, that the path to new life and new creation often runs through a cross, a, a suffering, a time of great suffering, or through the fire. Forests know this, of course. We, they know that sometimes it takes that fire to release their seeds, to regenerate the very life of the forest. An insight like this may very well lie at the heart of our Christian faith. For, as Jesus said, unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it cannot bear fruit. Well, how do we access these insights? One of the ways we do this is through finding ways to open our hearts to one another when we're going through times like the ones we've been going through lately. When I was talking with Kara recently, uh, she called me and we were talking about a, a very special request that had come to the church and what we should do about it. She had gotten a request to host an emergency wedding in our church on Saturday. I posted about this on Facebook. You may have seen it. A quadriplegic man with a terminal diagnosis was getting married. And his venue for he and his fiance had been canceled because of the wildfires. He was desperately calling around to church after church 
And Kara told me that, that as he tell, told the story to her, these churches were saying, no, I'm so sorry, we can't open up. This is just impossible. No, it's tomorrow. No, we can't accommodate you. And finally, he said, isn't there any church that can help? And, and, and somebody, I don't know who, said to him, well, why don't you try First Congregational? They seem to be willing to open their doors. They're pretty flexible. And so our church office got a call. And it got to Kara, and Kara said, of course, of course, we will make this happen. And then she got a little panicked, and she thought, did I do the wrong thing? I better call Janet. I, I better call, you know, the boss and make sure I'm covered for this, that, you know, I'm not making a, some kind of mistake here and hosting an actual wedding service in our sanctuary during COVID and all that. And we talked it through, and I'm like, you absolutely did the right thing. How can you say no? And as we reflected on this, she said, and I hope she doesn't mind my sharing this, she said, you know, I know, I know it's the right thing to do, but oh, it's really hard to get out of my home and go into the smoke and go down there and open up this church. And I said, you know what? I think in the end, you're going to be so glad you did. I bet anything you're going to come back to me tomorrow and you're going to say, I am so glad I did this. And of course, that's exactly what happened. And she knew it was going to happen because she said, you know, this is what I believe gets us through crises like these. It's three things. It's connection, it's community, and it's service. That's what will get us through. And she, she said the next day, I was right. It's that connection, that community, and that service that lifts us up. And this couple could not have been more grateful. And they shared tears of joy together. So friends, sometimes I know we have to ask ourselves, what happens when there is no safe place in the world anymore? What happens when it feels like there's no place to flee to? All I can say is we have two choices and both are good. We go in and we go deep. We reground ourselves in, in the, the sources of our faith in prayer and meditation. We stabilize our hearts in the great heart of God. And we go out and we go big. We go out in love and service and connection and we help our community. And we can even take inspiration from Jeremiah the prophet, who when the town, the city of Jerusalem was under siege, bought a plot of land at Anatoth. For he said, God said, we will again plant and harvest. We will again grow grapes and drink wine. For God has promised to restore our fortunes and to restore our land. There is a way to get to hope, but it's not easy. We go through the fire, but when we come out on the other side, if we have held on to one another, if we have rooted and grounded ourselves in love, and if we have let that love flow out of our hearts to touch others, we find the hope waiting for us on the other side. May it be so for you, friends, and please. Be safe, take care of yourselves, take care of one another. Amen.